Uh, so next we're going to have an update on the workforce investment board and return over to the members. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, I know Chris Neal is on the agenda for today, but I am not Chris. Uh, so Chris Neal is our new movie director. Um, I'm really excited to have him on board. He uh, brings many new of experience from SBS, including uh, some time he works with Dyer to me working on youth workforce youth workforce programs. Um, he recently had a newborn uh, son, so he's uh he's some time hours this morning and couldn't be to make it. Uh, but he's had his stress uh, this morning. So in addition to that, uh, we also have another another of our team, um, David Fisher, who is going to be part of the Center of Youth, Center of Youth Employment, um, but I also wanted to kind of introduce him and let him say more about CYU. Thanks, Ron. Um, so the mayor and the first lady announced the launch of the Center for Youth Employment um, about a month ago. Today is my tenth day on the job, so I haven't quite figured out our uh, our strategy and pathway yet to to get to 100,000 opportunities uh, each year for young people to work at skills uh, and connect with a supportive adult by 2020, uh, maybe by the September meeting, hoping. Um, the center is going to be a, a small operation, three to four people. Uh, we will not be running programs. We will not be um, kind of managing large staff or contracts. A little bit like the Center for Economic Opportunity in that we're really here to uh, help come up with a strategy, help um, advise DYCD and other city agencies with a role in this on how to do, you know, how to fulfill the mayor's vision of, of more and better. Um, so I want to thank the commissioner and his team. Uh, they've been very welcoming and supportive so far and looking forward to working more with them, uh, with our other agencies that have a role in this work and uh, uh, with, all, with all of you on the board and um, more to come. Uh, okay. uh, so one more note from the WIB is that um, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act at this point, WIOA. Um, so back in July of last year, uh, Congress and the President signed uh, WIOA in July of last year. And in April of this year, uh, the Departments of Education and Labor released their drafted proposed uh, regulations for how to implement the law. And so the WIB has been hard at work uh, alongside DYCD and uh, SPS. Uh, to put comments together to um, put New York City in the position that best serves um, its workers and its businesses. And so we definitely want to thank uh, Commissioner Chong's staff um, for working hard on that with us. The comments due June 15th uh, next Monday, and they'll be available on our website uh, soon after that. Thanks. So we're using the mic, okay. Yeah. All right, so thank you. Were there any questions? Any questions? Great. All right, so we're going to move on to the Summer Youth Employment um, uh, Jobs Campaign. And I'm just going to give a quick um, update and then also uh, provide a few thank yous. So um, right now, things are really going well with the campaign. Uh, the campaign's on target to hit the goal of 200 new private sector work sites, and, which will happen sometime later this year. Uh, the campaign has really been uh, really multi-sector or multi-faceted. Um, the youth employment providers, other city agencies besides ZYCD, the Youth Board, the Youth Council, the web have all kind of contributed to um, moving these numbers forward. And really there's a lot of thank yous to go around in this room. So many of you stepped up, Youth Board, Youth Council members stepped up and really provided uh, references and, and to work sites and really have been uh, helpful in building the campaign out. Um, right now, the numbers um, for the Youth Board, Youth Council, and WIB, uh, 15 work sites have been secured and about 40 jobs. And that doesn't include the ladders for leaders, employers, and a lot of those work sites and jobs are being finalized. So as I said, the numbers are moving forward and we're on target. So I wanted to give a big thanks to, to Scott Berger, who's not here, um, Liz Cribs, Greg Hamrick and Maria O'Connor for really for being employers and for providing uh, youth with opportunities at work sites. And uh, even though Scott's not here, um, he really stepped up and his firm has hired a lot of uh, S SYEP youth and um, he really has connected a number of employers to, uh, to the program, uh, eight employers in total. 
And he really has opened the doors to different networks. And we're hopeful that we can continue to do that as we go forward with new youth board members, which I'll talk about uh, a little later. And uh, also, um, in the at the September meeting, we're going to provide some final numbers then on the work sites, and we'll have a sort of final update at that. So, any, any questions, comments? Quiet today. Um, so now we'll move on to the to the um, youth board officer election. So I really want to thank um, all the youth board members who participated on the committee to uh, to really come up with the slate that we have uh, before you. And the slate is actually in the packet of information, um, so you can take a look at that. Um, we we really we really needed to develop a process and a, com and a committee, and we did it really in quick time. Uh, the committee is the Committee on Standards, Rules, and Nominations. And I really want to thank those who stepped forward. Um, George Gould's, um, Liz Cribbs, Nancy Waxine, Anthony Sumter, and uh, Priscilla Gould stepped up and really played a role in helping us to uh, come up with this slate. The slate is going to serve for 15 months until the next uh, annual meeting in September. And then we will uh, go ahead and uh, reform the committee and elect uh, new officers at that point. So um, the the it's late and it's in the it's in the pack, but I'll just go over the names: Anthony Sutter for the vice chair, Erica Larson for secretary, Sybil Silverstein for corresponding secretary. So I'm going to ask for a motion to accept the slate of youth board officers. Don't be shy. Oh. Thank you. Um, thank you. So uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. So that's it. We have new youth board officers. Thank you. Thank you all for serving. We appreciate it. Uh, big round of applause for the. I know it's Tuesday morning. It's uh, you know it's cloudy and gray. And, you know, I, I understand the energy. Is more. Okay. And, and also I want to take this moment, we have, we have a quorum, so I want to take this moment to actually um, vote on the minutes from our previous meeting. So I'd like to get a motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on. We're flying through this meeting. Wow. Okay. I feel like I should do a 10-minute monologue. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to now turn it over to the uh, Citizens Committee for Children to present on their community risk rankings. But first, actually, Commissioner, I wanted to I'll just uh, quick dialogue with you for a second to uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about um, why you wanted to present um, CCC to present at this meeting today. Well, they did a presentation. They did a presentation at the Children's Cabinet. Um, so one of the buzzwords of this administration is collaboration and coordination of our city agencies. It's something that uh, I worked towards since the very beginning. And so we're not, as a city or as DYC, doing a good job, as I said earlier, about leveraging our resources. So one of the things I think you'll see in the RFPs that come out for the Beacons and Cornerstones this year is really an emphasis on how you're going to be able to house other resources in that center. So we did a, we did a survey. Uh, unscheduled night visits of beacons, and we found something interesting. The beacon, there were many beacons that had free space that wasn't being used at night because they didn't have funding. Because one of the challenges we face over the last 20 years is maintaining substantial funding for the beacon program. So, but free space is a, such a huge resource in many of the communities. But we have programs starving for space. We have literacy programs that literally have to rent space for classrooms. So there's plenty of opportunities, and that's what Denise's job is, is to be able to look at what I call the three highs, high need, high capacity, and uh, high investment. And so, so part of the Citizens Committee for Children's analysis talks about the need issue uh, and, and, in a much more holistic way than I've ever seen it, because we tend to look at need as individual programs, employment, or health issues. But to be able to rank communities using a, a cross-section of criteria helps guide us because uh, on where we're going to begin to start doing our work on program integration. So we're, I mean, simple things that, um, 
again, we never thought about. I had a meeting with the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and they've always wanted to work with community groups, but they never had anyone willing to sort of partner with them. So I had a meeting with the Metro Plus people, because part of the challenge for HHC is trying to attract more people with health insurance. And but so one of the things we came up with as a way to sort of engage people who come to our beacons and cornerstones is a simple thing: uh, back to school uh, vaccination clinic. Something that we know a lot of the people who come to our centers need. It's a way of bring, providing a direct service to them and also perhaps converting some of these people to Metro Plus enrollees. So, but the data, we, what we don't have is the data about what are the needs in each community. And this is what I think the, the ranking system developed by Children, Citizens Meet for Children helps us do. So, we're actually having them come back in August to do a presentation to our senior management meeting, which is basically all our assistant commissioners and senior staff who meet on a monthly basis and the agenda is how do we accomplish program integration. I mean to give you one small example and I'll turn it over to them. One of the things that we have is we have nine or ten programs in DYCD under four different assistant commissioners that serve 16 to 24 year olds. They've never talked to each other until Denise convened the meeting. Uh, so and they're all specialized services, young fathers, you have SYP, you have programs for disconnected youth. And so part of what we're trying to do is not only geographical integration, but how we can begin to leverage our resources. The Summer Youth Employment Program this year, we're doubling the number of young people who are in the vulnerable youth jobs. Those are young people preferred by ACS, probation, or homeless services. We've never thought about using this as an on-ramp to our other suite of services. So we do these one-shot, six-week internships for these young people but we wouldn't build on that experience. So a lot of what we're trying to do now is, in a time of relative funding stability, is to begin to be more strategic about things. Because you know, I, I, this is the fourth mayor I've worked for. So I know what goes up will come down. So the question is, when, 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 when things are relatively stable on the funding side, let's really use this opportunity to create collaboration internally, collaboration externally not only with uh, among the nonprofits we fund, but with other city agencies. So that's the context of uh, why I wanted them to come, because I think the data is really rich. It's all out there, but it's never been, I think, packaged in this way. Uh, Commissioner, um, first let me say congratulations. I, I think what you're talking about is a great program, and I think you uh, collaborated with Metro Plus is uh, most certainly to be congratulated there, the, uh, your city owned agency. Uh, I think many people who work for the city don't understand the city actually owns two health insurance plans. So they get revenue from Metro Plus, which is what that means is the surplus. So if you're a for-profit organization like United, you give your surplus to someone in Florida or Arizona or California who's retiree. If you're Metro Plus, you give your surplus to Harlem Hospital or Kings County or one of the HAC hospitals. HAC <coughs> also owns Health First. I'm a vice president at first. We are probably three times as large as Metro Plus. So Metro Plus has about 400,000 members. We have 1,100,000 members. We insure one out of every 10 people who live in the city of New York. Any surplus that we get at Health First, we also give to Kings County, we give to Harlem Hospital, Coney Island, and all the AJC hospitals. We are very active in the community, and so I'd like to coordinate this with Metro Plus. I know Roger and the other people in Metro Plus I know everyone who runs Metro Plus, and they all know me. We are very active at this time. We're working in Van Dyke and Brownsville. I was looking at the list here. It's one of the areas where we have the uh, highest uh, concentration of poor health. We're very active at the Claremont Center in uh, Claremont in, in uh, the Bronx. It also is the poorest congressional district in the United States. Uh, so we, we are very active, and we're on the ground. We're doing things and in a very aggressive way. We'd love to partner with DYCD as regard. I mean, we have the resources. I'm the vice president. So I'm probably one of the few vice presidents who anyone in New York City knows. So so we um, you know we we'd love to be a part of this and, and the fact that I'm here and the fact that I know all these sites, the fact that I know the people who, who work at your sites and they know me and they know health first. Uh, we most certainly like to be a part of that partnership. I think you should touch base with Seth Diamond because uh, I know he's heading the outreach efforts and coordinated with Dow Rattray. 
But you know, you know, we love that. I think we just did something with your group the other day, didn't we? Right. Support yeah. something yeah. two days ago. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, and I and I've never gotten a call from your agency under you or your prior commissioner that I've said no. So I think that's an indication of our willingness as a not for profit managed care plan owned by all the hospitals in New York City to uh, partner with our constituents. We well the people you're talking about are my they're my members. Um, one of the things that we just started last year is we funded uh, 51 literacy zones across the state, 17 are in New York City, and you have to be, to become a literacy zone, you have to be in either a very high poverty area or concentration of limited English proficiency. But they have case managers and other services in those zones. So any way that we could connect those, there's an actual website you can go to that lists the zone over there. But you, don't. you should talk to Susan Haskell, um, because, um, the idea of co-locating services in the beacons and cornerstones isn't just limited to uh, CYCD funded programs. I mean, that's I use the HHC example, but uh, you know, we know that you know, beacons, especially, they're in schools. They have unlimited classroom space. They're open in the evenings. They're open on Saturday. And to the extent we can drive traffic there, whether it's something we fund, whether it's something that somebody else funds. I mean, that was Richard Murphy's vision. And I don't think the city has really done a good enough job of implementing it. Yes, yeah, we, we fund on Wednesday, we fund uh, exercise and Zumba classes in Van Dyke, Help First. We fund them in Claremont, we fund them in a number of other places. Uh, we also funded a Mother's Day event with, with uh, Councilwoman Gibson in Claremont. We funded a Mother's Day event in Brownsville. We funded, we funded a mother, uh, father and daughter dance in Claremont. So, you know, there are companies that, that want to do this sort of work, and uh, I'm one of them. So, so you know, Susan is please, a, please use our resources. No, no. And Susan, I think, would be the point person, because Susan oversees. I'm coming after you, George. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know partnership is a two-way street. You have an awful lot of people who, when they sign up their children for summer youth program, they don't have insurance. No one knows where those names go. And so, you know, I spoke to Marjorie Cardigan again about this, because, you know, the Department of Education gives us a lot of leads on 560 schools. DYCD, I don't know what happens to all your leads, but people say they don't have insurance, they'd like to be contacted, no one follows up with it. Well, that's why we want to coordinate with Metro Plus, since they are uh, the official arm of HHC. So, Susan will follow up with you after we reach out to Seth Diamond. www.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys.nys
uh, essentially the largest municipal level database of child well-being indicators in the world. Um, we have put out 11 editions of the Keeping Track data book that I think all of you got when you got here. Um, so that's the 11th edition. And the community risk ranking has been part of that book uh, for the past 11 years. So we've been producing that since 1993. Um, the methodology has changed from year to year because data changes year to year or the availability of data has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. Um, so over the past uh, two years, we did a lot of research on best practices of social well-being indicators and also social well-being indices um, to try to create a methodology that is very forward-looking, um, something that's simple to understand, transparent, easily replicable, um, and something that we can reasonably expect to collect all the same indicators year after year so that we can produce this in the future going forward. Um, so what we've come up with is we have selected 18 indicators uh, grouped within six domains of well-being um, and we had some criteria in terms of the indicators we selected. Uh, so we want to measure the well-being of children, families, and their communities and across multiple domains of well-being because we know that well-being isn't just about economic security or health or education, but it's across all of those domains. Um, we try to encompass all stages of child and youth development. Uh, again, we want reliable sources that will be comparable over time. And then two things that, that we included in our criteria so that you know, we can base some future work off of this is that we looked for indicators that would be reasonably comparable across other geographies so that maybe we could start comparing New York City and its communities to other geographies, uh, both cities, states, the US, and even internationally. And then we also wanted to make sure that we could disaggregate by racial and ethnic groups. So um, we're starting to embark on some work on um, looking at how these same indicators look uh, if we were to create an index that broke down by race, racial ac ethnic group to see how things are changing for the different racial ethnic groups um, across the city. Uh, so just getting into um, what the index includes, and you each have the, the report in front of you, so um, you'll see that there's a page for each of the, the domains of well-being and it sort of describes what you're looking at. So when uh, we're looking at economic security, we include the child poverty rate, um, the median income for families with children, and then an indicator that we call parental employment instability, which refers to the share of children who live in a household where neither uh, custodial parent worked full time in the last year. In housing, we're looking at uh, rent burden, which for us we de define as uh, household, renter households who spend more than half of their income on rent. Um, we also look at rental overcrowding, so renter households who have more than one person per room. Uh, and I should note a lot of this data comes from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, but we also collect data from other government agencies, city agencies, uh, etc. And then uh, the final indicator in the housing domain is the number of families entering homeless shelters per 1,000 uh, families. Um, yeah? Just while you're on housing. Sure. What, one of the things that is striking, and I don't know whether you were able to do it or what it would involve, is some kind of comparative as it, like, as it was the last time you did. What was so striking looking at it, I looked at where I lived, which I've lived for a long time, and I left because I live in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and uh -huh. I remember in, Fort Greene, in, in terms of the, the levels, I've been there a long time to watch that move up. The same thing I looked to see with the obvious in terms of the lower inside. But, it, but I think that it's also important, particularly when so much is being talked about in terms of housing and the ability to be able to afford to live in New York, is to do some kind, some kind of comparison, I don't know what that would be, to reflect the fact that the, of the changes in some of these neighborhoods. Yeah, it's interesting because when you look at things like rent burden, um, it, it can be a, a little surprising when you look in lower income communities because their housing stock sometimes isn't as good and so it isn't as expensive. So the rent burden doesn't always capture um, 
the struggle that families face in terms of housing stability, um, which is why we include all these other indicators. Uh, we also do deeper analyses. You know, this is kind of an oversimplified view. Um, we do, and in the book, we do some deeper analysis on who are the rent burden households, and we find that a large majority of them obviously are households living well below the poverty level, and households with children living well below the poverty level. I think that I, I just wasn't clear about, about one piece, and that is that as you go around the city and you see all the construction in certain neighborhoods, in the city, large neighborhoods in the city, is you say, who oh, no, can afford, yeah. afford all that? Which also then says, what happened to everybody who was here? Right. And that what happened to everybody who was here, in part from prior reports that you've done, well, they used to live here. Where did they then go? And that's really what I meant about the I issue see. of comparison. Yeah, sure. Um, we did do this analysis. Um, we looked back five years. We haven't published that data yet. So what the data that is described in this report is all 2012 data. Um, that was another thing that, that we changed the methodology on. We used to sort of just pick whatever the, the most recent data was for each indicator. And now we're looking at a distinct time period, so we're trying to capture you know, a moment in time and, and how the different communities rank in that moment. Um, so the data that's in the report is 2012. We have this data going back to 2008, and you know, we'll be going forward. So one of the things we'll be doing in the future is looking at sort of this over time analysis using this data. Um, but, but I think to get at your point, it takes a, a bit of a deeper dive to understand what's going on in terms of in-migration and out-migration of communities and, and you know, what happens when the housing stock, when brand new condo buildings, large, you know, the housing stock is changing. Um, you know, that's a little beyond the scope of this report, but it certainly, you know, this report helps us sort of frame the questions that we want to look at in terms of that. Um, so just moving on to the, the health domain, um, the first thing we have here is the infant mortality rate, which is, you know, kind of used the world over in terms of uh, a proxy for general well-being in communities. Uh, we also look at the percentage of low birth weight babies, um, which reflects sort of healthcare access, but also, um, you know, if you have a large percentage of low birth weight babies, presumably you may have a, a larger percentage of children who may have additional health problems down the road. Um, and then we look at the share of children without health insurance, um, which citywide is very, very low. Um, in some communities, it's, it's significantly higher. In education, we look at early education enrollment. So we're looking at the share of three and four-year-olds who are enrolled in some sort of early education program. And this is an estimate based on census data. Um, we also look at elementary and middle school reading and math tests, uh, pass rates. So that's the common core standards that we're looking at. Um, and then we look at high school graduation rate. And that's four year as of June. Um, in youth, so now we're looking at sort of a different developmental stage. We're looking at uh, the teen birth rate, which we get from DOHMH. Um, we look at teen idleness, which refers to the share of 16 to 19 year olds who are neither in school nor in the labor force. So these are youth that are often referred to as disconnected youth, or I believe um, some people are starting to frame that in a more positive way and saying, you know, opportunity, uh, an opportunity to, to intervene here um, and get these kids engaged in either education or the workforce. Um, and then finally, we look at youth unemployment, which is actually the share of 20 to 24 year olds who are unemployed. So here we're kind of, again, looking uh, to an older age cohort than we typically look at at Citizens Committee for Children. but but um, trying to sort of capture both what teens have to look forward to in terms of the labor force that they're moving into um, and also you know, how youth are faring. And then finally, the last domain is family and community, so sort of capturing some of the um, conditions around children. So we're looking at the share of children who are living in single parent families because we know that can be, um, can be a stressful situation or can add added stress to a household. 
Um, we look at the adult educational attainment in the community, so the share of adults 25 and older who have less than a high school diploma. And then we look at the violent felony rate. Um, so those are the different domains, and each um, of the community districts are ranked within those different domains. But then we also have an overall risk ranking. Um, so, you know, in tandem, these two sorts of things give us a lot of information. Um, the overall risk ranking can kind of give us a sense of where risks to children and their families concentrate um, overall. But then you can look at the different domains to sort of understand the different needs of different communities. Um, and I kind of have a, a small example here in the area of health that we've started to look at, and this is starting to drive some of our own framing of questions for additional qualitative research. Um, so in the area of health, we've got um, Borough Park, which is uh, Brooklyn Community District 12. And Borough Park actually has um, ranks pretty high in terms of risk, or, or moderate to high in terms of risk in things like economic security and housing. Poverty rate is higher than the citywide average. Um, much lower median incomes for families with children there. But they rank number one in health. Um, and looking at some of the indicators both in the risk ranking and then outside of the risk ranking, we saw that you know they have very few mothers who are going without prenatal care as compared to the city as a whole. Their infant mortality rate is very low. So they're having very, very good health outcomes. Um, and then you can contrast that with Queens Community District, um, I believe that's 13. Um, it's Queens Village. Queens Village has a um, relatively high median income for families with children. I think it's somewhere near 70 or 80,000. Um, relatively low child poverty rate, much lower than the citywide average. But they actually rank um, pretty high in terms of risk and health outcomes, and that's driven in large part by poor birth outcomes, um, high infant mortality rates. Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. One is, does the, um, so my first question is, does the report account for overlap between subjects? So like medium, medium household income and rent burden kind of have like sort of overlap? Yeah, I mean, so no. Everything's weighted equally, um, which is kind of the standard practice in um, social well-being indices. Um, we ran correlations, and obviously those types of things are correlated. Um, but you know, the purpose of this is to try to be as simple and transparent as possible. Um, obviously, you know, child poverty correlates pretty strongly with most of the indicators that, that are in this. Um, but we do see, the reason I'm pointing these examples out is that we do see uh, situations where child poverty isn't necessarily driving um, risks in other domains. Um, so the, I guess the short answer is no, everything's weighted equally. Um, we do know there are correlations between a lot of these indicators. And it's just something, it's one of those caveats you have to be aware of when you're looking at this data. Um, and, it, and I think when you understand that, it makes these sort of weird uh, idiosyncrasies that much more telling. Um, so with Queens Village, we know they have a low poverty rate, but high, high rates or, or poorer outcomes in, in birth outcomes than the city as a whole. Okay, great, thanks. And my second question is, because um, I know this is just an overview, did the report analyze food insecurity at all? Because I know that that's really major for a lot of children. It is, and it's very hard to get data at the community district level for that. Um, you can get data at the county level, so at the borough level. Um, but this analysis focuses on data that we could reasonably expect to get year, each year going forward at the community district level. So unfortunately, we couldn't include anything on um, food insecurity. That's one of those things where we sort of look at this overview data and then determine maybe we want to do a deeper analysis in a certain community. And I know we're thinking about um, doing some mapping projects in terms of um, summer meals locations and uh, we've also done some work um, in things like food deserts. Um, I also know that DCP does a lot of stuff and we're actually setting up a meeting with them to talk about their work in that area. So it's certainly something that's on the agenda, but it's not 
um, something that's captured in this analysis, unfortunately. Thanks. Sure. Um, so anyway, this is just to illustrate that, you know, different communities have different needs and the purpose of breaking out the different domains of well-being is to sort of try to get at uh, the different needs that different communities face. Um, we've also been talking to Commissioner Chong about sort of overlaying this data with some site-specific um, community asset or resource data. Um, so trying to understand where needs maybe do or don't match up with community resources. So that's, that's one of the next steps getting into our future work. Um, so I mentioned that we've collected this data since, two, or we have this set of data going back to 2008 and we'll continue to collect it um, going forward. So we'll be looking at trends over time. Um, and part of that will be sort of trying to analyze how programs and policies are, are making these indicators change, moving the needle, hopefully. Um, we'll also be working on our racial ethnic analysis using the same set of data. And then, again, comparisons to other geographies. And the bullet that's not here is, is working with um, agencies and other institutions to sort of start doing an asset mapping to understand where needs and assets either match or don't match. Um, and then just to, to plug some of our other resources that I think are probably of value to most of the people in this room, there's the book that you all have in front of you, um, which goes into sort of a, a deeper analysis on a lot of the indicators that I've just talked about, um, both at the citywide level and down to the community district level. Um, and in the, the back section of that book, our geographic profile pages. So each of the 59 community districts, the five boroughs and the city have a page that looks like this, which has um, five years of data for 33 key indicators of child well-being um, and a few charts and maps to go with that. Um, and then finally, I would, I would mention that we have um, a very rich online database that's available. Um, you can access all of our data for free online. The URL is a little easier than the <laughs> literacy <laughs> zone URL. We're bureaucracy. <laughs> it's data.cccnewyork.org. Um, and you can explore, uh, we have hundreds of indicators um, across the 59 community districts, the five boroughs. We also include um, school districts, UHF districts, um, and indicators in all, you know, across all domains of, of child well-being. Um, you can do maps, you can do charts, you can download these images, you can download raw data. Um, we hope it's a really useful tool um, for people like yourselves. So I would urge you to take a look at that. And it's updated, it's evergreen, so it's updated as soon as na new data becomes available. Whereas the book we put out every two years, um, this will always have the latest data. And I think that's it. So I'd be happy to take any further questions. Yeah. Hello. Great. This is a lot of information. It's great. Um, without data, you can't pinpoint certain situations. We look at the previous, but first I looked at it while I was there. And it made it easy for me to pinpoint that on one of the records I was saying. Mm -hmm. In a high rent, they got reported. And that was in um, housing, which is incredible. Um, they had 25 rent. Thank you. I mean, a lot of the work that we do is around uh, child poverty, um, and to a large degree, we do know the programs that are working, um, thanks to a lot of the work done by the Center for Economic Opportunity and their um, 
their CEO child or their CEO poverty measure. Um, that analysis really shows that things like the earned income tax credit, food stamps, things that are targeted towards families with children are very much working to lift families with children uh, out of poverty. Um, you know, in terms of our own analyses, that's sort of work that we're just now embarking on um, and starting to link this data to some of the more programmatic data, working with DYCD and other agencies um, to understand how the different programs that they're implementing are affecting different communities. You know, that's a work in progress, so we don't actually have anything to report on on that, um, but we'll definitely, hopefully be producing some things um, to get at that. starting to talk to a lot of different people about how you might define assets um, and there are, as you might imagine, a lot of different ideas. So one would be programs. Um, so we can get the physical locations of programs and start mapping those um, and then you can either aggregate those up to the community district level or, or program participation also. Um, we spoke with, um, we've spoken with a lot of academics and researchers who are sort of working in this field. Um, someone suggested that um, utilization of public benefits might actually serve as a proxy for assets because um, A, that's resources going into a community. Um, you could look at that in a negative way, right? If a large share of a population is getting public assistance, for example, you might say, oh, that's maybe not so good. But on the flip side of that, that means that resources are going into that community. Um, and people are engaged in uh, government programs that help them, so they're actually going out and getting the resources they need. Um, so that's one thing that we're looking at, maybe access to public um, assistance and, and food stamps and other public programs. Uh, so again, program utilization. Um, and then, you know, a lot of researchers are looking at physical plant type stuff, so actual infrastructure. Um, so we're kind of exploring all of these ideas. Um, right now we don't have a defined scope for that project. Um, I think we're going to be engaging you guys and other city agencies to kind of understand how um, different uh, constituents think of community assets to inform that work. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you all use the resources and, and please use us as resources as well. We're, we're here to answer questions um, on data research policy. Thanks. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to point to a couple future items. Um, first is that we are in the process of, where there's the, there are several candidates for the youth board that are in the process of being vetted, and we hope that they will begin with us in September at the, at the first meeting of the new year. So um, we're, we're hopeful that that will happen, yes. Okay, and then the second item is, uh, one of the changes we're going to make to the, these meetings going into the new year is that we really want to have, have a, uh, get more feedback from you as the youth board and youth council on the program integration that's taking place at DYCD. And um, actually Robert and, and George actually modeled this very well today in providing feedback about ways that DYCD can connect different programs. So, we really are asking you to really think about that because we're going to try to provide more space at meetings for your feedback. So we really want you to be vocal 
and engaged and involved. And that's sort of something we want to try to move forward with the new iteration of this, um, this board and the Youth Council. So I'm asking you each to step forward and provide us with as much information and feedback as possible. And we'll be in touch over the summer to, to give you some more details about what we're thinking about that. So with that, are there any announcements before we close out? Have a great summer. Enjoy the warm weather. We'll see you in September. Thank you, everybody.